Welcome to this installment of the Secure Your DNS, Secure Your Network video series. My name is Tim Rooney, Director of Product Management of BT Diamond IP. The goal of this video series is to provide bite-sized videos talking about various ways that the domain name system or DNS can be attacked or manipulated for nefarious purposes and to provide some suggestions for ways that you can protect your domain name system implementation from such attack or manipulation. In this video, we're going to talk about what's in a name, or particularly what's in a domain name, and how attackers could perhaps manipulate your domain name in the DNS for nefarious purposes. The first method of attack here we'll talk about is brand jacking or cyber squatting. This is where someone actually registers a domain name for a known brand, perhaps it's your brand, pretty prevalent back in the late 90s and the early days of the internet before companies really got on board with the internet. These days, though, it could perhaps be if you're a celebrity or about to become a celebrity where someone registers your name, but it is something that they could use to sell the domain name back to you or the brand holder at some point at an exorbitant rate, to monetize the domain through advertising or affiliation. So if people think they're coming to your site, they end up at this, the site that the attacker stands up to be able to collect advertising revenue, perhaps, or to filter it back to your site. Uh, through uh, affiliation links for added revenue as well. They could redirect traffic to a competitor, set up an imposter site to fish sensitive information, so enter your email address or sensitive information, uh, set up an imposter site to smear the brand holder, so that's certainly not something you want to have your brand uh, smeared by an imposter site, or also to drop malware or adware hosting onto would-be browsers that they think they're coming to your site. So as a double whammy, they're affecting your brand by dropping malware and also affecting the device, the browser itself, who's seemingly coming for your site. So this is an area where someone actually copies a brand that, that you might have rights to and sets up a domain there. So something obviously very sensitive. Now a variant of that type of attack is called typo squatting. So here's where you're actually Perhaps you've got your brand name covered and you've got your own domain set up in the various forms of that, but there are many cases where people mistype a name or they use the wrong case uh, or what have you. And this is where an attacker can set up domain names for these perhaps would be typos and set up websites looking like yours so that people who misspell Equifax, for example, or Google or JetBlue or ESPN in the wrong TLD, top-level domain, or even using a different country code, top-level domain. They could end up getting to what they think they're getting to your site, but they could end up on an attacker site. And again, you have the same, really the same set of motivations with respect to holding onto that domain to sell it back to you at an exorbitant price, monetizing the domain through advertising or affiliation, again, as an imposter site, redirecting traffic to a competitor of yours, the imposter site, again, to set fish sensitive information or to smear the brand holder or to drop malware. So all these motivations are possible. They're acting as your site, but because of the typo that perhaps the user didn't realize when they typed in the web address, they end up at this site. And uh, I've been honest to them, they get perhaps mistreated by these various forms. Another type of naming attack is the use of homographs or homoglyphs. DNS was originally defined using ASCII character encoding and the internationalized domain names for applications, IDNA, RFCs, were published by the Internet Engineering Task Force. And this adds the ability to encode Unicode characters into ASCII characters so they can be represented in the DNS. So this enables a web browser, for example, to display native characters in a URL or non-Latin characters, and then it provides a mechanism to convert those non-Latin characters into ASCII. So here we see an example of CyrillicApple.com. It actually looks like Latin characters, doesn't it? So it's very deceiving just looking at it. But that translates to an ASCII representation of the XN dash dash which is the characteristic view of a IDN internationalized domain name. So these lookalike characters can fool the eye if you see it on a web page and you click it, getting directed to another site for all those motivations that we talked about earlier. And even within ASCII, there is potential for confusion depending on the font that is being displayed. So the number one and the lowercase l, capital 
O and 0, for example. So uh, even within ASCII, this, this is possible. Also, the use of other languages. I mentioned Cyrillic, the small letter A, which is Unicode character 0430. And uh, it looks a lot like the regular A, as you can see above in the Cyrillic representation there. And there was actually a, an attack in 2017 which was used to spread Betabot malware, which used the homoglyph for Adobe.com, which actually was just the B character, was a, uh, a Cyrillic character and mapped to an internationalized domain name. It was used to drop the malware. So that was one of the motivations we talked about earlier, and certainly a vulnerability should a user click that, thinking they're going to Adobe or thinking they're going to your site and being misdirected to a site that perhaps looks a lot like your site but is being used to drop malware or to smear or to otherwise collect sensitive information. Other domain abuses over the years have been identified and, and regulated against. So front running was basically if I started to look at a domain, maybe I'm interested in, in defining a domain, this was a mechanism where someone could actually then register that domain in advance of you purchasing it in order to raise the price to sell it to you at an exorbitant rate. Domain tasting is a way to set up a domain and perhaps there was a grace period where you could use it free for 30 days and after that you would be charged. So this is a mechanism where you would use it for 29 days, for example, and, um, and tear the do let the domain expire or tear it down or before the billing started. Domain kiting is a variant of that where you would let it go for, let's say, the 29 days, cancel it, and then on the 30th day set it up again using the same domain name and kind of going another 29 days, canceling it, setting it up and, and in this way bringing it up and down and up and down successfully over time in order not to pay for it. Reverse domain squatting is really just a, a, a means of attack by, let's say someone's being attacked by a domain manipulator, and this is a way for the person being attacked to attack back, thereby the reverse, uh, to squat their domain and really just uh, play tit for tat, so to speak, and try to come to a conclusion there. Domain drop catching is where a domain has just expired and someone picks it up and perhaps the prior domain holder forgot to renew it, the domain expires, they go back to try to renew it and now all of a sudden someone else has it and they're charging an exorbitant rate. There are uh, remedies that you can pursue for people having a domain name that can be proved to be under your service mark or trademark but is being used in bad faith. And really that's part of the, the mitigation strategy here is when the International Corporation of Assigned Names and Numbers, ICON, was formed in the late 90s, one of their main tasks initially was to help address this nefarious use of legitimate domain names. And so working with the UN's World Intellectual Property Organization, WIPO, they published a Uniform Domain Name Dispute Resolution Policy which enables a complainant who holds a domain name or who desires to hold a domain name to raise a complaint against someone who actually does hold that domain name. And they have to show that the domain is identical or confusingly similar of the complainant's service mark. The registrant has no rights or legitimate interest in the domain name. So if it's not a brand of theirs or a close affiliation or product, etc., and that the domain name is being used in bad faith. So the various motivations we discussed certainly qualify as bad faith, and such use would enable the complainant to bring that domain name back to them and pursue remedies that uh, could be brought against the attacker who had used that domain in, for bad reasons. U U.S. equivalent is the NSA Cybersecurity Consumer Protection Act, the ACPA, which provides similar a similar approach in the US. So these are really the remedies that you can pursue should you find that a domain name is very close to yours that is being used in bad faith. In order to detect that, you want to certainly be vigilant of what domains are out there, uh, train your users in terms of you know being aware of IDNA or just limit the IDNA support in your browsers. And that of course would apply if you're really just using Latin languages your users are using, Latin alphabets, that uh, you could perhaps limit your iDNA. However, if you do have users throughout the world who are using native language, I mean, it is a good feature to have that people can use their, the internet using their native language, but it does bring out that exposure to lookalike characters or homoglyphs to be considered. 
So various forms of domain name attacks can be realized and the main thing you can do there is to attempt to identify them as they appear on the internet to try to prevent them if you can and uh, by pursuing or collecting those domain names yourself but also really just maintaining that vigilance to be able to uh, take action as required.